Hello, everyone, and um, welcome. My name is James Harding. I am the editor of a slow news company called Tortoise. And I ended up leaving a world of fast news, the FT, then the Times of London, and then the BBC, because I was finding myself more and more overwhelmed by the information we were getting and worried about the quality and the knock-on effects on politics and policy. And I find that the conversations that we have at Davos are in that spirit. They are that moment you stop and hopefully look away from the inundating wave of information that you get and think, well, how do we make sense of this? And perhaps there's no bigger this than the integrity of the internet, given that it is the way by which we manage all of our business, all of our information, all of our government, and most centrally, our societies. And in preparing for this, in thinking about the conversation we're going to have about safeguarding the future of the internet, I have to say that I cheated, which I recommend you all do the same, and read the blogs uh, of Wolfgang Kleinwächter. And so my only request is that if you are using your phones during this session, <laughs> that's because you're reading Wolfgang's blogs <laughs> rather than messaging, because you will find uh, not necessarily things that you all agree with, but certainly the provocations that get you to clarity about what you think. Th this group, it, it, I should say, is also in the spirit of the World Economic Forum. One of Wolfgang's blogs makes the point that in 1996, it was at Davos that people started thinking about the future, the future of cyber interdependence. And it makes sense now that we are worrying deeply about the future of the safety and integrity of the internet that we bring together quite such significant players on this subject. So, uh, Jen uh, Easterly uh, joins us. Jen, thank you very much for making the journey uh, from uh, the United States, is President Biden's Director of Cyber Security. Uh, no small portfolio or problem to try and wrap your head around. And we're going to spend most, I think, of our conversation focused on the de declaration of the future of the internet that the US is leading and about 60 other countries are participating in, and hope that's a good way of structuring our conversation. Uh, Wolfgang Kleinwechter, as I said, is an academic uh, uh, Aarhus University, but probably the leading kind of thinker in this particular uh, area. Uh, and Rado Ali has the uh, unenviable job uh, uh, at the United Nations of overseeing uh, uh, the fight against drugs and crime, and more than ever, that's on the internet. So that's the group we're going to uh, uh, hopefully share ideas with. I always think the nature of these small things is they're much, much better in many ways than those huge plenary sessions. We can all weigh in. At the end of the session, there's sort of 15, 20 minutes even for thoughts and questions. If you've got a comment on the way, I'm not a great one for rules, please do just sort of put your hand up and we'll bring you in in the course of the conversation. But Jen, can we, can we do one thing before, if you like, we get started on the bigger sort of 2040 picture, which is right now, in all of the discussion about the war in Ukraine, in fact, in all discussion about any coming military conflict, what we've been warned about is a cyber war, and it just doesn't seem to have happened. Now, maybe you're seeing it and we're not, but what's your read of how cyber is playing out in Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Uh, so it's great to be here with such a distinguished panel. Look, I should say at the, at the outset to your comment, James, about overwhelming news and trying to step back. Uh, you know, we had a pretty horrific event yesterday in the States, and I just want to say that, um, you know, most of us woke up this morning heartbroken, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we are really with the families. Um, you know, that is... Uh, a small part of my mission, I actually protect infrastructure, and schools are part of that, so right. we have school safety, and so it's a tough day, really, for anybody, yeah. quite frankly. You know, your question uh, is a great one, because I think, because of the nature of the war so far, and the brutality, frankly, of the kinetic uh, activity, and just the horrific tragedy that we have seen, uh, cyber has sort of been seen as, oh, you know, I haven't seen the spectacular attacks that maybe we saw in 2015 when the lights went out for several 
uh, for several hours for hundreds of thousands of people, or even 2016 or the NotPetya attack in 2017. The reality though, James, is there has been a very active cyber component in this war. Uh, it's been both an individual uh, component where we've seen uh, destructive attacks, we've seen denial of service attacks, we've seen defacement attacks on both government, ministries, and critical infrastructure, and a pretty serious attack on communications against uh, VSATs that we just recently attributed with our partners to the Russian government uh, that then had bleed over effects into Europe. Hmm. And so cyber has been used both on its own, but it's also been used uh, to enforce and to uh, enable some of the kinetic attacks that have occurred and actually strengthen them. So uh, to me, I, I think that it has played a role. And what I really worry about is a couple things as this war drags on. We're just getting into the fourth month. Uh, as the lead of America's cyber defense agency, we have been working with the private sector, who of course owns most of the critical infrastructure in the U.S., to make sure that they understand the threat to their networks, to their systems, to their data, and that they're able to mitigate the risk of a potential Russian cyber attack on the US, deliberate, maybe in retaliation for the severe costs that have been imposed on the Kremlin, uh, maybe a bleed over effect, as we saw in Europe on those uh, VSATs, communications terminals, or maybe something uh, like the NotPetya attack, folks will remember in 2017 yeah. when there was a Russian attack on a server in Ukraine that then bled over and affected multinational corporations around the world to the tune of $10 billion or uh, the potential unleashing of criminally aligned ransomware groups. Of course, uh, everybody remembers the colonial pipeline attack mm -hmm. where uh, shut down uh, gas to the eastern seaboard for mm -hmm. four days mm -hmm. and had a massive psychological impact on really uh, brought cyber to the fore. So I think we have seen cyber, even though it may not have been as uh, spectacular as folks were expecting. I think it's played a significant role in this fight. I think we'll continue to see it. Um, and again, I think we need to be on high alert <coughs> for attacks that uh, can occur in Europe or for attacks uh, that occur in the homeland as well. And will you just explain, Jim, you know, the United States, NATO allies have provided weaponry for the Ukrainian people, for, for Ukraine. What's the provision of cyber capabilities, and particularly offensive cyber capabilities, against Russia? Yeah. Um, so I am the nation's cyber defender, uh, so I don't do the offense mission, but I've spent a good bit of my time in that space helping to stand up cyber command. And of course, we work very closely with our intelligence community partners and with our uh, U.S. Cyber Command partners because, quite frankly, we have to be cohesive as a U.S. government. Wolfgang was making some comments on this earlier about uh, the tribal nature of some of the uh, uh, cyber actors in this space. Uh, but certainly, uh, as has been publicly reported, we've had uh, capabilities that have been forward uh, to help work with our partners to make sure that they understand the space. What we have been doing is we serve as what's called the US CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team. So we work with 100 CERTs around the world to share information about uh, technical data, indicators of compromise, mitigation guidance. And we've, of course, been working with the Ukraine CERT before the invasion, but uh, really on a daily basis uh, since the invasion kicked off to help them understand the nature of the threat and also to share information uh, that can help us understand how to better protect our networks. And, you know, James, I think if there is, you know, silver lining is probably not the right word, but I think if, if I'm encouraged by anything, it is, it is the alliance is back. Uh, this global cooperation and collaboration, not just at the political level, but really the work that we've been doing with our cyber defender compatriots across the world, I think is a positive sign and really speaks to the main topic of this of this panel and kind of the declaration where we brought countries together is this is not a mission that we're going to be able to do as one country. This is all about collective defense, collective safety, collective security, uh, collective resilience. Can I just, before I come to that, yeah. can, I just, can I just pick up on that point about collective? So yeah. I'm sure most people here have read the or have at least read the reporting on the Declaration uh, on the Future of the Internet. Uh, and it, it strikes me that it's quite interesting, these five pillars, the way it's organised. The second one, if I read it right, is around the integrity of the Internet, that we don't have a splinter net. We don't have two or possibly several different Internets. Uh, and you just mentioned, Jen, 
this kind of collective effort, but it's a collective effort of some, not all. You know, it's very different from the membership of the United Nations. 60 countries is not 180. And do you think that, even with the best intentions, what you're in effect setting up is a Western declaration of the internet? Yeah. The future of the internet, I should say. Yeah, I mean, certainly best of intentions to work with our like-minded partners. Um, and and uh, Wolfgang should really weigh in here, because I know he has some strong views on that and how it relates to other efforts going on. I think it would be terrific if other countries joined in. I worry a lot about the balkanization of the internet, the splinter net as you called it. And you know, we were talking earlier about there are many pieces of paper out there and some are just words. Uh, so what we need, I think, is to take advan advantage of this moment in time where uh, we can either come together globally or we can splinter further to try and bring together nations. We may not agree on everything, but to try and forge uh, what ultimately needs to be a secure, resilient, free, and interoperable. Yeah. And interoperable is the key word for China because remember, um, we need to have an interoperable internet to be able to use it for uh, commerce. And so there are some incentive uh, levers there that I think we can, we can pull, but this is not a trivial problem. Do you think, Rada, from the, you know, I appreciate that one of the sort of incredible headaches of working for the UN in any capacity is trying to balance the interests of quite so many members with quite so many different agendas. In this particular case, though, the argument, at least in probably the, all our lives, has been the internet is a public good, a good for all, and, and everyone, every citizen of the, of the earth benefits. Do you think that that period of time is coming to an end, that in effect the internet is breaking up and that the job of the UN is going to be to try and bridge those gaps? Not at all. I think that <laughs> Good. The, the countries are getting together and they got together in December 2019 with a General Assembly resolution asking for a global convention to regulate uh, and prevent crimes uh, that are uh, taking place in this space called the internet. So the global crime prevention and criminal justice response is what countries are asking for. So there is a realization between different parties that there needs to be some harmonization of legislation mm -hmm. um, between the West, the East, the North and the South. Uh, we all need to have in this space some regulation that protects, prevents, but also uh, addresses crimes that are developing at a speed and of a new nature that we are not necessarily all aware of and that a country alone, and you have just said that no country, even the US, the largest, the most advanced ones, are not able to stop crimes uh, that are taking place in the internet space alone. So there has to be, I think it's a realization that global cooperation and collaboration is needed. There has been great progress because while at the beginning, when we were given this assignment to have a convention by September 2024 and to share the text of the convention with the General Assembly of September 24, we thought we will never be there. Mm. But actually, and among the reasons what's happening in Ukraine, among other things, and among them is COVID, by the way, which has made countries realize how this has become an integral part of education, of health, of commerce, of a lot of activities, and so much is going on in the criminal space. And criminals are always ahead of the curve. So uh, they are always innovating. And countries are not keeping up with this innovation in, in, in crimes. So there is this, I think, realization. And there is a big hope because we see countries coming together and sitting and discussing. And we have a roadmap. Of, of days with topics, of six sessions with very specific topics. Another realization is the realization that the private sector and civil society have to be included in this discussion. Yeah. So countries have realized that no one country is able to do this alone and that governments alone will not be able to do it. And private sector experts, individual experts, academia is also uh, coming into uh, the discussion. So, so this what? is of itself the reason for my hope. Excuse me. It, hope or confidence, do you think you'll hit that 2024 deadline? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly hopeful. Yeah. We're doing everything that we can. 
We have more than 200 NGOs that are already involved and entities that are already providing input and information. Uh, so uh, between meetings, there are constantly uh, discussions that are taking place. Some are very, very promising discussions. And we see that even between countries that come from two very different premises, there is a realization that there will be a minimum of agreement on some basic principles right. to protect the people, protect women, protect children, the vulnerable, also access to computers, human rights, involvement, in, 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 you know. There are a lot of elements that countries are uh, agreeing on and, you know, and there are now very specific topics for the six planned sessions. Um, right, I'm going to come back to you because I want to hear from Wolfgang. Wolfgang, will you just follow Ralph's point? Where do you think there won't be agreement? Where are we not going to find ourselves having some kind of global agreement around future of the internet? You know, uh, academics are working with scenarios. So, and uh, looking into the future, you can always have a best case scenario, a worst case scenario. And what I've learned over the many years is at the end of the day, the reality will be elsewhere in the middle. Bill Clinton has sometimes this defined as a process of stumbling forward. So you're stumbling from one point to another point. There will be never a clarity or now we have settled the problem. So it's an ongoing process which will keep us busy the next 20 years. So if it comes to the um, uh, um, options for global arrangements, so I think what we see that uh, while there is an acceptance that it's a global issue, uh, national interests are playing a bigger and bigger role because the internet now penetrates all areas of uh, policy in, in a yeah. given country. So while 20 years ago a lot of governments said it's a technical issue and we have some experts, but we are dealing here with big policy, economy policy or things like that, now big policy in every country is internet policy. Mm -hmm. And this makes it difficult. And here we have a problem because the internet is a layered system and on the ground layer uh, we have all the technical specifications like the domain name system, IP addresses, root servers, name servers, which enable communication. We have the philosophy of one world, one internet. Mm -hmm. But on the application layer, we have one world, 193 national jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So, and this is a natural conflict. And so that means it, uh, it would be an illusion to expect to move from one world to uh, one, 100 united, uh, 193 national jurisdictions. That mean harmonizing of the uh, global level, it's impossible. The risk is what we see, and some big governments, you know, have probably a dream, not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow, uh, to have, you know, uh, one world uh, on, on the ground level to splinter, to control it. Yeah. Because certainly if you control the transport, layer, then you have also control on the application layer. So there is a conflict between the two layers. So and uh, the starting point here for um, forecasts is what are the real interests? And what I see is that while national interests are playing an important role and you have divergency, there are common interests even among, you know, China and the US and to say because the, 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 the ground layer is, uh, some people have said, you know, all these critical resources are like the air of the internet. Mm -hmm. And in the real world, you have no Chinese air, no American air, you have clean air or polluted air. So it would make no sense to splinter the ground layer at, at this moment. The situation could be different in 20 years from now. And so far, I see a chance that you have a reachment and an agreement uh, uh, in certain areas, you know, probably on a case by case basis, uh, facial recognition, AI based facial recognition could be an area where everybody agree, and even China has supported the UNESCO declaration on ethics on AI. So there are small fields where you have common agreement, but then you have to live with the disagreement. So, and this will be a battle for the next 20 years. Can, can we get into that? And, and, and please, I catch my eye if you want to weigh in on any of these things. Can we get into the sort of granular areas where there might be some agreement and then the gaps? But bef before we do that, Wolfgang, can you just help me with one thing? Forgive me, this is probably a stupid question. I grew up with this idea of one world, one internet. 
And I completely understand the analogy of the air, clean air, polluted air. There's no such thing as national air. But I did also grow up with the idea of national sovereignty and accountable governments. And I just wonder whether or not the fear, the implicit fear of a fragmentation of the internet is founded. Whether or not actually, if we did have different transport systems and different application systems, globally we would have a more competitive digital space and we would also have potentially a more democratically or at least nationally accountable one. And I wonder whether we're too fearful of breakup and actually there are merits to it. You know, the, uh, uh, in the early days we had a lot of uh, ideas of an alternative route. So it, we are talking about the route of the internet, which yeah. uh, includes uh, with the domain name system. And then, you know, a, a guy called Metcalf came up with the Metcalf law and said, okay, the value of the internet is growing ex uh, exponentially with the number uh, of its participants. That means if you have four billion in one internet and then four million in another internet, that's no real competition. So in so far, all ideas of an alternate internet failed in the past because, you know, this was too big uh, to, to change it. If you, and, and China has introduced uh, this idea in my eyes as a test a couple of years ago in the ITU, and they said, okay, we, the, the internet is based on the TCP IP protocol, which has some weaknesses, security, latency. Let's discuss a new internet protocol and uh, which uh, for 5G applications and things like that. So, and this has provoked a big discussion. And, and certainly you could have an alternative internet. But if, and, and if China, India, Iran, and, and uh, Brazil goes together, they could create a network of two or three billion. But what would be the result then? You would need an exit visa from the Yana route and an entry visa into the BRICS route. Mm -hmm. You could right. call it a BRICS route. Yeah. So I think that's not in the, at, at the moment, it's not in the interest of nobody. That, that's why, you know, people even in China say they have now accepted ICANN and say we can live with this. What the situation will be in 20 years, that's a different story. Just have a, Jen, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree with it. Um, where I'm thinking about uh, is really going back to the point about the transport layer as opposed to the application layer. Um, because among that declaration, where I focus on is on the secure piece. And Wolfgang was saying, you know, back in 97, we weren't really having these conversations. And it's interesting because over the past couple of days, we are having a conversation among you know, security geeks like me about cybersecurity, but I fear that uh, many of our world leaders, many of our business leaders see security uh, as somebody else's business, mm. uh, as opposed to something that is truly core to our freedom, our human rights, uh, our ability to exchange information uh, freely, and our ability to conduct commerce. And so I really think um, even as we worry about the things on the application layer, I really think that we need to uh, put a lot more investment and effort into realizing that, uh, quite frankly, you know, if we are not securing uh, the internet, if we're allowing um, uh, rampant cybercrime, if we're allowing continued espionage, if we're allowing destructive activity and disruption activity, and, and that then manifests in effects against our critical infrastructure, um, I think that's, you know, a huge issue for the world. So I think the focus there is incredibly important as well. Well, well can we turn to that? Can we talk a bit about commerce and crime, the kind of serious crime rather, that you have to deal with, uh, the, but the question I think for pretty much everyone in the room in one form or other is the increase of cyber attacks and I don't mean just national infrastructure mm -hmm. I mean corporate cyber attacks mm -hmm. one of the issues and I think we talked about this before Joan one of the issues I think for lots of companies is that when that ransomware arrives the rules country by country and the interpretation of the rules country mm -hmm. by country is pretty opaque mm -hmm. And I just wondered whether or not you think we're moving to some agreed understanding of what you're required to report, when and when and when you shouldn't actually pay. You know, what what are the 
What's the system for dealing with and repelling cyber attacks? Do you feel as though it's clear enough for companies? Yeah, for companies um, in the US specifically, uh, there was a new law put in place to mandate reporting of cyber incidents, uh, but that is just for critical infrastructure companies. Now that is a huge swath, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean a small business. Uh, so that doesn't only captures a portion of, of uh, what might have an impact. It's 72 hours for a significant cyber incident and 24 hours to report if you paid a ransom. Um, so we are starting to put some of the infrastructure in place to understand that ecosystem of cyber attacks. Uh, but quite frankly, we think we only see about you know 25 to 30 percent of what's there. So it's very hard to weigh in on what is actually happening, and therefore it's hard for us to come together to say this is what we need to do globally to reduce risk. Certainly we can talk about the things that we need to do to manage risk, uh, the mitigations we need to take around cyber attacks, but ultimately uh, ransomware is a form of crime and crime will continue to happen. The issue is we want to be able to uh, lower it as much as possible and the only way we can do that is to again first principles fundamentally focus on how we secure our systems and our networks because I think it's important for every leader to understand that most of these cyber attacks are successful not because of some exotic uh, well-resourced uh, long-time developed uh, nation-state attack it's because uh, that business or that entity was not doing the basics to keep themselves safe. And that's mm. why education on cybersecurity, I think, is so incredibly important. Is it just, just so I understand, is the 24-hour is the window for reporting if you have paid a ransom mm. an implicit um, approval by the government of the United States for paying ransoms? It is not at all an implicit approval. In fact, <laughs> as you know, James, and we've talked about this before, um, our recommendation, and it's not a law, the recommendation of the U.S. government, the strong one is not to pay the ransom. So will you just explain, Jen, the reason I'm just being slightly mischievous yeah. there is I don't understand why if there's a system for paying a ransom and a mandated reporting requirement, yeah. that works. Because if I was running the company, I'd yeah. think... Well, okay, the government acknowledges that we can pay ransoms, we probably will. Yeah, certainly not an acknowledgement. I mean, at the end of the day, many of these firms don't want to um, right. acknowledge that. And so you could actually say this is sort of an incentive oh, I uh, see. Uh, that they don't want to pay. And so, you know, you could read it both ways in your on-brand mischievous uh, interpretation. <laughs> so, 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 so your point is that your point is that the reporting requirement is intended to disincentivize the paying of ransoms. Well, you know, the Congress had the proposal requirements. Yeah. And so I think uh, at the end of the day, it was to get better understand the ecosystem. Okay. Uh, but certainly um, there is a disincentive if you have um, had to, first of all, if you have a, a breach to report, mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to fix. It's, you know, we're not in, in this business from a cyber defense perspective to name, to shame, to stab the wounded. But we are trying to understand what that threat environment is, and first and foremost, to help people uh, to be able to mitigate risk to their networks. Well, Joan, thank you. Uh, I'm going to come to everyone for questions and thoughts, so please do, you know, pull your hands up, as I said. But Radha, can you, can you just tell us a little bit about that specific issue, you know, sort of your, your executive director, I think, of the UN Office for Drugs and Crime. Mm -hmm. You know, often in these events, we talk a lot about the corporate end of this, but the really hard end of it, the really the really violent and dangerous end is is your responsibility. What, what do you see is necessary in order to improve the internet to reduce the impact in terms of drugs and crime? I think building on what was just said, there is this element of the global cooperation, but there's also an element of cooperation at the national level mm. between the government and the non-government private sector and NGOs, and also building capacity of institutions. So uh, being the secretariat for the new convention on cybercrime is just one element of our work. But other elements include capacity building, strengthening the capacity of the private sector, companies, SMEs, government institutions, and member states that are not uh, the size of the, the US, the very small countries uh, and places where there's no <coughs> regulation, where there are uh, a lot of abuses, 
uh, where there is exposure to the dark net. There's a lot happening at the dark net. And what you have just described, what the U.S. is trying to do, in my understanding, is that they're encouraging people to report, to understand the ecosystem, yep. and to get better clarity in order to better regulate. So uh, it's a process. It's a journey. And I think as the, the process is developing, better understanding and better collaboration would take place. But at the national level, there's an element of capacity building. There's an element of national regulation. But there's also investigation, collecting evidence. There's this whole story of cryptocurrencies and how it's used uh, on the internet mm -hmm. uh, in an illegal form. Digital forensic evidence. These are small um, interventions here or there where a lot of investment needs to happen in infrastructure, in capacity building, in the, the cyber security space is a wider uh, and bigger space than what we are specifically uh, speaking about, which is cyber crime. And how can we define those crimes? Investigators and the criminal justice system, that's a whole area where the criminal justice system is not able to deal with because they have not been trained and they have not been exposed. And many, many, many countries do not have laws uh, or regulations uh, or training for the criminal justice system from uh, you know end to end uh, uh, to, to address these issues. Uh, so this is also a, a side of our work. Uh, and Ronald, would you just tell people, what are you most worried about in terms of developments that you see in cybercrime? I mean, there's a whole range of things, and it's constantly, again, developing. So there's the illegal access to computer data, illegal interference in computer systems and data, uh, and, and these are important. But we also see a lot of child online abuse and exploitation. Um, in the first six months of the COVID and the lockdowns, we've seen more than 9,000 sites for child exploitation and abuse. Hmm. Uh, so there's also a lot of... Uh, uh, commerce uh, and trade of firearms, a lot of efforts and activities in radicalization and violent extremism happening in the on the on the internet. There's the hate speech. There is the 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 you know dissemination of this information. So there's a lot happening that is addressing youth. That is very disruptive. Not just the commerce side of it, but also there's the education element and what can be shared or not shared or. Uh, the, the misinformation mm. that is being shared. Mm. So now that the internet is part of our lives as an interfering with everything, there's a lot, there has been a lot of trade on fake vaccines on the internet, for instance. Right. At a time where countries were rushing to, uh, to uh, buy vaccines and to buy medication, there was a lot of, of equipment uh, that is traded on the internet that is fake, that is a falsified medication. There's a lot that is happening in the area of illicit trade. Firearms trade is happening on the internet. Small weapons trade is happening in the internet. So there's a lot of, of regulation that needs to take place. And, the, and just like any cross-border organized criminal activity, there is the country of, of uh, the, in, the initiation, that's the country that is receiving the issue, and there's, there are the transit countries. Mm that are not necessarily involved. Um, questions, thoughts, observations, deeply held worries, <laughs> unspoken anxieties, all of these things <laughs> live around our thinking on the, uh, on the internet. Um, if anyone has a thought. While you're, while you're marshalling your, sir. Hello, my name is Martin from the World Week Forum. A couple of years ago in this very room, Jonathan Citrin was uh, bringing forward the notion of actually getting a license to operate on the internet. I would like to know if the panel has an opinion on that one. Jen, do you want to start? Yeah, um, I, I, I like it, but probably not in the way that Jonathan uh, intended it. Um, you know, I think when you think about digital natives versus digital immigrants, you know, all our kids are very facile on all kinds of devices these days from the youngest of ages. Uh, and they learn how to operate them, but they don't necessarily learn how to secure themselves. I think anybody that is using technology needs to understand at a very minimum how, how to make sure that they're secure. And it's not rocket science. At the end of the day, uh, it's things like 
uh, passwords, strong passwords in a password keeper, it's updating software, it's multi-factor authentication, uh, it's training on how to protect yourself from phishing email and things like that. I think uh, we uh, focus too much on just how to operate and not enough on how to secure. And so this is an area where I'm very focused. In particular, uh, I am on a serious campaign uh, to get everybody to enable two-factor authentication. So um, if I can get everybody here and everybody online to uh, help with that campaign, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, to be able to be secure, I think, is fundamental to being able to operate effectively. Okay. Uh, you know, my answer is uh, it makes more sense to invest in ethical education. Uh, so, because, you know, to make this, the good guys stronger. Uh, you know, you, you have a license system in the traffic, uh, and uh, you have people who ignore uh, the law. So that means how to m remove the bad guys from the highway. So uh, that, that, that means a license system will not settle um, uh, the problem. Uh, but um, to invest in education is an investment in the future to make the whole system more safe. But you have to... to, uh, to Tell also the truth. You know, this problem will be with us the next 20 years. This will not go away. And we have a big problem. Uh, so, Jen is with defense. But, you know, in the internet, offense is easy and cheap. Defense is complex and expensive. So, that means you have a huge gap here between defense and offense. Normally, you know, between defense and offense, you have more or less. Uh, it's on an equal level. But in cyber, this is this huge gap. And, and this is a problem. In so far, cyber security starts at home. And that's why, you know, training, education is so important. Uh, and uh, uh, this is better than to create another bureaucracy. Uh, other questions? Thoughts? Wolfgang, can I just follow up on one thing, which is that because the, the question is around kind of individual responsibility. When we talk about safeguarding the internet, actually what we're looking to is our governments to secure it. And the underlying question at the start of our conversation was about the division between values in political systems and how that translates into safeguarding the internet. I think generally it's more difficult for them to answer the question directly. Do you think, Wolfgang, that autocratic governments will be better at safeguarding the internet than democratic governments? They, they will do it differently. <laughs> I'm sure they will. So, and and uh, like always, you know, as a, uh, you know, the dialectics of the processes is that even, you know, in a bad system, you have good elements. And in a good system, you have bad elements. You have to understand the contradictions within the system. So, but we have two universal values. I think that's why the title of the declaration from 1948 says it's the universal declaration of human yes. rights. So, and that's the basic criteria. You know, under this, you can have different, different ways how to handle this. And that's the problem, uh, you know, uh, when you have uh, the opportunity to agree on these universal terms. Then you have to learn at the same time to live that other countries do it in a different way. Yeah. So uh, th th that's, you know, uh, th th the inherent conflict will, will not go away. You will not harmonize 193 uh, uh, jurisdictions. So that means you have to live with different approaches. But th the challenge is to agree on, on these universal values and then to pick out where you can agree on, on, on very concrete issues. I th in, in so far, ransomware could be a door open for a new understanding, but this is an interest of all. I have an interesting <laughs> parallel. You know, in the Middle Ages, we had these pirates uh, on the higher sea, which, uh, you know, made money on the basis of a letter of protection uh, from a certain country. And it took 100 years of negotiations that all countries agreed in the Paris uh, Law of the Sea Convention from 1865, so that... Uh, such letters should not be given to pirates uh, because the, the letter said, as long as you attack the ships of our enemy, then you can use our harbor. So, and uh, in so far, you know, a lot of people said, I'm safe, I have a harbor, and 
I will not attack the ships of, 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 of my safe heaven, but attack the ships of others. And this is the situation we have now in cyberspace. So a lot of countries are you know, hosting cyber criminals on the basis that they will not attack yeah, yeah. infrastructure in this country. But this is backfiring. And in so far, you know, if it comes to ransomware, that's critical for everybody. And if we could have, I'm skeptical when you say the long list of issues. Uh, I would, I do not see any chance to agree on a global level on hate speech and fake news. No. Uh, but I see a chance to agree on some of the issues you mentioned first, so uh, interception in, 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 in um, networks or in when, computers. When I mentioned hate speech, yeah. I, was, I was responding to his question about what are my concerns yeah. about okay. the other risks. But okay. actually, the discussion is much more focused. And it's based on the premises that you have just mentioned, that there is a global realization that no one is safe. Mm -hmm. And, that, and we, that we will be respecting sovereignty, which you have also mentioned. So while respecting national sovereignty <laughs> and at agreeing at the same time on adequate protection of human rights, there I can see that there will be some common ground on some few uh, and not an extensive uh, list, but on few basic uh, uh, things that what countries... What are they, Will you tell us what they are? It, it's still being discussed between countries, but you know, providing safe haven to criminals. Uh, no country is safe. Uh, a, a minimum level of security uh, that is needed by all to protect commerce and economics and other things. Uh, I think there is this realization that uh, countries need to get together from both sides of the aisle to really uh, agree on things that will protect them all. This realization is, two things have happened. This realization that nobody's safe on how critical um, the internet can be to our life after COVID, mm -hmm. and the fact that um, the, no, can, there is a huge divide because COVID also has exposed the world, the fragility of the world, and there is a huge divide. So countries are not at the same level of development or penetration of the internet, but it's happening very quickly. So as you have said, it will be a discussion for 20 years to come, but there could be a minimum level of agreement, I hope. All right. Well, it, it does anyone have a we have time for one more question, sir? Uh, yeah, when you speak about governments and countries, uh, if you include software and hardware, for example, uh, hardware from China 5G, uh, software from Russia, uh, <laughs> internet security software. So what do you think about? Jen, why don't you do that? Yes, well, <laughs> we, we have made it um, pretty clear. Um, uh, that we are concerned about uh, software or hardware uh, from nations that have shown a propensity to go after networks from an espionage or a destructive or disruptive. And so um, we've actually um, take some of, taken some of that out of our federal systems and have joined with partners around the world. Um, I worry a lot about uh, uh, how we can keep up with um, what we don't know out there. Um, you know, obviously, Huawei, uh, Kaspersky, um, uh, there are discussions going on with the latter, and certainly from a federal government perspective, we've um, removed it from our networks. But uh, at the end of the day, I don't think that um, uh, we are not going to come to any sort of a uh, collective agreement on issues like that. And so we are going to have to continue to stay ahead of, um, you know, working with our like-minded partners, stay, stay ahead of um, issues that might actually threaten things that we control. I mean, going, going to the larger issue about governments, autocratic, democratic, um, our, net, our critical infrastructure is largely owned and operated by the private sector. And so while we can tell the federal government, hey, you need to remove these types of uh, equipment or software from your networks, uh, at the end of the day, we can't really make those kinds of statements on a uh, private network. So um, it's very hard to shape that ecosystem for security <coughs> in any sort of um, collective way. Joan, thank you. Um, uh, do stick around, and, and I'm sure people want to have word with Raoul or with Wolfgang or with Jen. Um, uh, we try to keep things on time, so for that reason, I'm going to bring things to a close. And I'm going to bring things to a close, if I might, with just one point. 
Uh, it's pretty easy to be in Davos in 2022 and think to yourself that a world that for a generation has been coming together is coming apart. And so I just want to, if you like, end with the optimistic note that, Lada, you offered us, which is there is possibility that between now and 2024, we will get to a global agreement, even on a set of minimums. Mm -hmm. That's the beginnings to something that we've never had before and that the actually, you know, thoughtful work on a declaration on the future of the internet gets us quite a long way there. So I hope people take some comfort from the meaningful and constructive work that's being done. Please uh, join me in thanking our panelists, Radovali, uh, uh, Wolfgang Kleinwechter and Jenny Sli. Thank you very much. <laughs>